ladies, I will tell you that you have two down and one more to go. So welcome everyone to our third service of the morning. Uh, I've noticed that many of the ladies are eating a snack in between. Uh, I never have done that before, but they're getting a snack and they're saying how hungry they were. So we're going to try to be right on time in our starting so that your significant others or husbands and sons and daughters can take you out for lunch today. So I hope they treat you very, very well. Today, as you know, is Mother's Day. And I want to take just a moment and to recognize all of the women of our congregation. Uh, Linda and I agree on the importance of recognizing all of the women of this church, not just our mothers. And so I'm going to ask if you are a mother to please stand. Please stand. And if you are a lady and you're not standing, please stand also. If you are a young lady, please stand. Um, it, is, it is important to me, please remain standing, um, that we take a moment and we recognize all of the women of this church. Each of you makes a significant contribution to the life of this church. We are better people, better men, a better congregation because of each of you. Thank you for sharing your gifts, your thoughts, your ideas, your lives with us. Thank you for sharing your faith with us. Many women have wanted to have children, and that has not been a reality, but they have been involved in mothering young people throughout the life and age groups of this church. Others have continued to uh, help and aid and to just to be present in many ways to all of you ladies on this your day and on every day. A sense of appreciation and happy Mother's Day from your pastor, from the staff of this church, from my family, from all who are gathered here. We honor you this day. So please be seated and I think we can give them a round of applause. They have done a phenomenal job uh, throughout the first two services in the presentations that they have made this morning. Um, someone said to me, I had to hurry down to the front because I was supposed to go to work. And then they said, oh, yes, right, you're not working today and all kinds of stuff. Little did they know that I'm not working next week either. Um, Bob Harris is our speaker. And please remember the box that's out behind Judy's uh, head in France on the other side of the wall there. Um, it's a box to honor Kay and Bob as we thank them for their service with us next Sunday morning. They're not going anywhere. Um, Bob has said he would continue to help as needed. Uh, the Reverend George Patterson will be coming. Um, you know, Bob and Kay are going to be attending church, and they come to the 8 o'clock service and doing those things. But um, we, we just give thanks for them. Also, I want to say a word of welcome to the Pine Tones. So part of them are here today. Um, and I had heard a lot about them, but because of COVID and all the other stuff, I had never heard them. And I got to hear them at Dave's service. Where's Darlene? There's Darlene at, her, at Dave's service, and you guys were awesome. You did a tremendous job. Thank you for being here, and we welcome you in Christ's name. I do want to share with you just a few announcements. Um, number one is that um, many of you will remember the Colburn family, and uh, it is with sadness that I report to you that Sue Colburn passed away this week. Um, I did not know her, but she was described to me, and this has been what everyone has said, as a delightful and wonderful woman. Someone when you needed to get something done in the life of the church, you asked Sue, and she probably already had it done before you asked. Uh, the services for Sue, if they are held in, in the way that we kind of think we're planning right now, will be sometime in July, about July 11th. That's when her family from Pennsylvania can be here with us. So please do remember that family. Uh, please remember the family of the Reverend David Herr. David is a colleague of mine. He was actively serving a congregation 
and David passed away on Thursday of this past week. Um, that means I'm going to need to move the date for the book club because his widow has asked me to please attend his service. Uh, so more about when the book club will be rescheduled and um, do remember that family also. Uh, this week we have two funeral services, one on Thursday here at the church for a member of the community and one on Saturday for the Campbell family. Uh, we had postponed the Campbell family's service, Betty's service, two or three times because she has family in Scotland and Canada. We were trying to find a time to get everyone together. We could not and still have not, so we're actually going to be Zooming uh, the service to Scotland and to Canada, uh, and part of the family will be here that day. So please remember her husband, Kenneth, and all of their family in your prayers. I also want to mention to you that on this morning, uh, I, if I doze off, here's the reason. On Friday evening, Zach and I had a father and son outing. We went to the Orioles game. And you might know, uh, uh, Joe, we were talking about baseball. On Friday evening, there was a rain delay of two hours. The 7 o'clock game started at 9 o'clock. And I got home at 3.36 in the morning. Let me just say to you that at 58 years of age, 3.36 does not sound nearly as attractive as it used to. And there was nothing going on in Ocean Pines at 3.36 in the morning, except at John and Marion's house, where there was a big party. Um, but I do want you to know I will not doze off, but I'm still sort of recovering from being out that late. It was quite a night. And I got some wisdom this morning when I came into church. Um, whenever I need wisdom, I just go to Mr. Harrington, and he gives me all the wisdom I need. It would be, it'd be you. Um, and, and so I want you to stand up for just a minute and share the wisdom that you shared with me. Now you can take your mask down and, and share how we should end the sermon and the services here in your thinking. He was telling me that he wanted to try to use the word inoculate, but we couldn't find anything that rhymed with it uh, or spell it in the too. So the, the final thing this morning is just I, I hope that you have a very wonderful, blessed Mother's Day. And I hope that you take the time as men and families to honor those, those women who are part of your lives, but not just today, but every day, uh, some significant and important way to recognize the fact that they are very special and they are a gift to us in our service and our lives here at church and everywhere we go. So I'm going to turn to Dick for our prelude and I ask you to join me as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
Good morning. My name is Linda Baker, and I am currently the president of the United Methodist Women, and welcome to this Sunday where we honor mothers. Recently, I put out an email to the United Methodist Women telling them that Pastor Dale had so kindly invited us to organize the service today. I want to thank all these women who volunteered to participate this morning and all those who are supporting us with their prayers. I also want to thank Maud for her many back and forth emails with me about this service. And I thought to myself, gee, I'm glad I don't have to do this every Sunday. And then I thought, well, you guys do have to do this every Sunday. So I have a whole new appreciation of some of the uh, complications and uh, details that are required to do this service. The United Methodist women throughout history have always had an emphasis on helping women and children around the world. Women of the church have played increasingly important roles in society and families. Those women deserve to be honored because so many of them are unsung heroes. To be inclusive, I think it's important to honor those women who are not biological mothers, but who have inspired, mentored, and stood as surrogate mothers to children or teens in families, neighborhoods, and communities. They may not be biological mothers, but they have mothered nevertheless. Probably many of us have known women such as these. I know that I stand in awe when I read or hear about women in our world who have faced enormous challenges, who continue to share and live their faith and their amazing ability to multitask while performing their responsibilities and their calling. So on this day, let us take time to pause in gratitude for the women in our lives, mothers and others, who have supported and nurtured us. Please listen as I read a, our opening prayer adapted from a Native American saying. Dear Lord, teach us that a strong woman is one who feels deeply and loves fiercely. Her tears flow as abundantly as her laughter. A strong woman is both soft and powerful. She is both practical and spiritual. A strong woman loves, forgives, walks away, lets go, tries again, and perseveres. A strong woman, in her essence, is a gift to the world. Lord, help us all to seek to improve ourselves to represent you in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. My name is Gail Philippi. Please stand and we will read together and remain standing for the hymn Amazing Grace following the call to worship. And Jesus said, come. To all mothers and children, Jesus said, come. To the motherless and the childless, he said, come. To all who belong to mothered, Jesus said, come. Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest in your souls. Please be seated. And I, I do want to tell you that we invite you this morning to sing. Uh, that's the newest thing that's out, but we invite you to sing with your mask on. Um, that way, if you're like me and you sing poorly, no one will hear you. Um, but we do invite you to sing, and um, as the days progress, we're going to continue to be safe, but we do invite you to be involved in the music of this church, which is a great blessing to all of us. So sing with your mask, if you'd like to. You can hum, you can listen, whatever you feel God calls you to do. But one of the things that we look forward to is that chance we get really to sing without the mask as a congregation.
I just wanted to say that the words to this song that we're about to sing were written to the melody of Onward Christian Soldiers, because mothers are soldiers. So happy days to all your moms out there and to all our moms who've got the And it is on, not on. You would get right. <laughs> Thank you all for that gift of special music. It was indeed special. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Lynn Bowen. Please hear now the texts for today, which are from the book of Proverbs, chapter 31, verses 
25 to 27, 17 and 30 to 31. She is clothed with strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise, and she carefully watches everything in her household and suffers nothing from labor. Laziness, excuse me. She is energetic and strong, a hard worker. Charm is deceptive, and beauty does not last. But a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. Reward her for all she has done. Let her deeds publicly declare her praise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please join me in praying our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. My name is Nancy Waters. Faith is defined as a strong belief in God and as complete trust in someone or something. Today we are going to hear about four women who were faithful to God and loyal to those around them. Ruth, Harriet Tubman, Esther, and Nanny Helen Burroughs. We honor them today as women of faith. This is the story of Ruth. My question is, what kind of relationship did Ruth have with her mother-in-law, Naomi? In the violent times of the biblical judges, Naomi and her husband, Umelech, and their two sons had come from Bethlehem of Judea to the territory of Moab because of famine in the land. Imelech died, and Naomi's sons took Moabite women as wives, even though some religious leaders had opposed marriages to non-Judean women. After about ten years, both of Naomi's sons died. At this point, Naomi was desolate and decided to return to Bethlehem. Naomi had changed her name from Naomi, which means pleasant, to Mara, which means bitterness. She told Ruth and Orpah, her other daughter-in-law, to go back to their people and their gods in the land of Moab. Why? In these times, if a woman was widowed, her brother-in-law was to marry her and protect her. Since Naomi wasn't likely to have any more sons, she made this demand of them. Orpah turned back. But Ruth said that famous quote to her mother-in-law, Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Ruth is loyal and faithful to her, despite Naomi's bitterness. And at this point, we know that Ruth has accepted the God of Israel. It was the beginning of the barley harvest season in Bethlehem. Naomi and Ruth were destitute. Ruth gleaned, gathering fallen grain on the land of Boaz, a wealthy relative from the family of Umelech. Boaz noticed Ruth for her diligence, urged her to stay on his field and under his protection. But I am an immigrant, Ruth said. He replied, everything you did for your mother-in-law after your husband's death has been reported fully to me. May the Lord reward you fully for your deed. May you receive a rich reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you've come to seek refuge. Boaz ordered his harvesters to leave extra grain in the field for Ruth. When Ruth returned to her, Naomi said that Boaz was one of their close relatives, a redeemer. 
May he be blessed by the Lord. He hasn't abandoned his faithfulness with the living and with the dead. Ruth gleaned with Boaz's young women until the barley and wheat were harvested, and she went back to stay with her mother-in-law. When it was time for the threshing, Naomi gave Ruth some interesting counsel. She told her to bathe, put on perfume, wear nice clothes, and go down to the threshing floor where the men slept. When Boaz was asleep, Ruth was to go and lay down on his feet. And Ruth said, I will do everything you are telling me. Was this good advice? When Boaz woke during the night, he asked, Who are you? She replied, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread out your robe over your servant, because you are a redeemer. In the morning, Boaz sent Ruth home with six measures of barley for Naomi. In front of the elders and townspeople, Boaz bought the right of redemption from Naomi's closest relative and all the land that belonged to Emelach, including Ruth the Moabite. And he accepted the man's sandal to bind the deal. And so Boaz took Ruth as his wife, and they had a son. The women of the town said to Naomi, This child will restore your life and sustain you in your old age. Your daughter-in-law, who loves you, has given birth to him. She is better for you than seven sons. Naomi found peace, happiness, and love. As Obed's mother, Ruth became Jesse's grandmother, King David's great-grandmother, an ancestor of Jesus, the great Redeemer. An awesome ending for all. Happy Mother's Day. Oh dear, what did I do? I should have left it alone. Good morning. My name is Molly Lefave. <laughs> I should have just left it alone, huh? Thank you. In June of 1944, a new U U.S. ship was commissioned. The name of that ship was the SS Harriet Tubman. That's just one of the facts I have learned in, in uh, getting ready for this today. Harriet Tubman was just a phenomenal woman, and there's no way I could tell you all of the interesting things about her in this short time. So I urge you to go to the visitor, visitor center near Cambridge and maybe even take the self-instructed uh, driving tour that covers parts of Maryland and Delaware and I, I think there's something like 30 stops on that route, uh, all about Harriet Tubman. She was born in 1821 or 1822, or maybe 1825 or 6. Uh, in those days, they did not keep records for enslaved people, so, no, so she never knew exactly how old she was or what her birth date was. I don't know about you, but I think uh, birthdays are very special, and it makes me sad to think that there have been so many people who didn't have the advantage of knowing exactly when their birthday it was. She was born in Dorchester County on the Anthony Thomas Plantation. Uh, her given name was Armenta Ross, and she was called Minty for short. When she was 14 or 15, uh, she was in a general store, and at that time, a man had tried to escape. The store owner picked up a, a two-pound weight from his counter and tried to throw it at the uh, man who was trying to escape. Uh, Harriet blocked the way at, at the door, and so she was hit in the head by mistake. Uh, this changed, of course, her whole life. After that, whether it was uh, narcolepsy or whatever it was, she had a, a sickness that she would fall asleep just at any time, and that sleep might last up to a half hour. 
Uh, she said that when this happened to her, she felt that she had visions of God and that he was instructing her. Um, so it, it changed her whole life. In 1844, she married John Tubman, and that's when she changed her name to Harriet Tubman. In 1849, she had seen two of her sisters being sold away, and she was afraid that would happen to her. So she decided to escape and go north on the Underground Railway. Uh, she made 13 trips back after that to help save her family and friends. Uh, she, her nickname at that time, or she was known as Moses, because she was freeing all these people. She liked to travel at night, and she preferred traveling in the winter time or taking these people in the winter time because there were more hours of darkness, and that's when they actually traveled. During the Civil War, she volunteered and worked with the Union forces in Hilton Head, South Carolina. At that time, she was a cook, a nurse, a laundress, a teacher, a scout, and a spy. She was the first woman ever to lead an armed raid. And when, when she did this, she freed over 700 slaves. In 1869, she married Nelson Davis, um, and they had a brick-making uh, business together. In 1890, she worked with Susan B. Anthony and other suffer at suffragettes, I'm not going to say that right, am I, um, in, in hopes of gaining the vote for women. Another interesting thing about her, I think, was that in the late 1890s, she said she was in Boston. She went into a hospital there. She asked this gentleman if he was a doctor, and he said yes. So she asked him to operate on her to relieve the headache she was having. He did so, but the thing that's especially interesting about that is that she bit on a bullet rather than get anesthesia because she wanted to follow what she had seen the soldiers do. I wish, I, I wish we had the rest of the day. I could tell you some other things. I just urge you to find out about her. She truly was a phenomenal woman. Uh, in closing, I'd like to read from the book Harriet Tubman, The Road to Freedom. Tubman cherished her freedom and her citizenship more than most, certainly more than those who had never been in bondage. Besides a commitment to racial justice and a passion for liberty, Tubman preached the power of persistence. Throughout her Underground rail Railroad career, she offered the following refrain, if you are tired, keep going. If you are scared, keep going. If you are hungry, keep going. If you want to taste freedom, keep going. This motto has been handed down to the present generation as part of her enduring legacy. Born into an age of darkness, an age when America was still in thrall to slavery, Harriet Tubman freed herself and was reborn. She renamed her liberated self and hoped to lead others to Canaan as well. This was not because she saw herself as a hero, but because she believed she was doing the Lord's bidding. Not unlike Joan of Arc, with whom she was frequently compared, Harriet Tubman viewed herself as an instrument of God. However, Tubman did not manifest any messianic qualities, nor did she particularly see herself as chosen. She did not trust in fate as much as in the power of prayer and in the individual's ability to seize her own destiny. Tubman embraced a much more universalist view each and every person has the light of God within. And just like the song, she was going to let hers shine. In 1868, Frederick Douglass lauded Tubman by lamenting that while his role in the anti-slavery crusade brought him applause and encouragement, God bless you has been your only reward. The midnight sky and the silent stars have been the witnesses of your devotion 
to freedom and your heroism. But history is also a witness to Tub Tubman's heroic deeds and sacrifices along the road to freedom. And although historians may have too long ignored it, her past remains before us, all around us, and urging us, in her own words, keep going. Good morning. My name is Esther. My story is told in the Old Testament book bearing my name. I was born when my people, the Jews, were held in captivity by the Persians. I was once young and beautiful, so lovely that the Persian king, Xerxes, selected me, a Jew, to be his queen in place of the queen that he deposed. I was orphaned and raised by my loving uncle Mordecai. When the king and I were married, the king promoted him to a minor position in the Persian government. While he performed his duties, he uncovered a plot to assassinate the king. Mordecai told me the plot, and I told the king, giving Mordecai credit for reporting it, and the plot was thwarted. The king's highest official, a wicked man named Haman, hated all the Jews, especially Mordecai, and devised a plan to kill every Jew in the kingdom. The king agreed to Haman's plan to annihilate the Jewish people, and again Mordecai discovered the plot and told me about it. He told me that I shouldn't think I would escape just because I was the queen, and suggested that maybe I was put into my position by God to save my people. I had to act. First, I urged all the Jewish people to fast and pray for three days for deliverance, and I did the same. Although it was against the law, I approached the king without being summoned, even though I might be killed for doing so. I told the king I had a request of him and invited the king and Haman to, and Haman to a lavish banquet. There, I revealed my Jewish heritage as well as Haman's diabolical plan to kill me and all my people. The king flew into a rage and ordered Haman to be hung on the very gallows that he had built for Mordecai. He then promoted Mordecai to Haman's position. Although exiled and essentially powerless and marginalized as a woman by society, I was used by God to show his sovereignty at work in the lives of his people, providing salvation for his children. And thousands of years later, Jewish people still serve, uh, celebrate the Feast of Purim to commemorate the deliverance of the Jewish people at this time. Please remain seated and let us sing together. For the beauty of the earth, hymn 92.
Good morning. My name is Mary Boyd. I'm going to share some information with you about Nanny Helen Burroughs. Nanny Helen Burroughs was born May 2nd, 1879 in Orange, Virginia. She was the eldest daughter of John and Jenny Burroughs, both of whom had been slaves. Her father was a farmer and a Baptist preacher. After her father's uh, death, Nanny and her mother moved to D.C. and they stayed with one of her mother's sisters. In D.C. there were better opportunities for education and also for hunting for jobs. So um, Nanny uh, attended M Street High School, which was supposed to have been one of the best high schools uh, for uh, black children in the district. Uh, it was organized by um, <clears throat> Harriet Beecher Stowe Liter 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 Literary Society. She studied business and domestic science and she wanted, after she graduated from the M Street High School with honors in 1896, she sought uh, work as a domestic science teacher at that in the District of Columbia Public Schools. But she was unable to get that position uh, because for some reason they decided that her skin was too dark and she was the wrong class. Uh, they preferred lighter complexioned black teachers. So her skin color and social status had thwarted her for the appointment for which she um, was chosen. So Burroughs said that the die was cast to beat and ignore both until death. This zeal opened the door to the profession for low income and social status black women. This is what led, uh, led Ms. Burroughs to establish a training school for women and girls. And her school was actually called the National Training School. It was opened in 1908. In the first few years of being open, the school provided evening classes for women who had no other means of education. And the classes at first were taught just by Ms. Burroughs herself. There were 31 students who regularly attended her classes. However, after a time, and due to the high level of teaching, the school began, att uh, began attracting more students. So the school uh, was actually uh, founded in a small farmhouse and it was located in Northeast DC, which is now part of uh, Deanwood. Uh, originally, during the first uh, 40 years of the 20th century, uh, young African American women were prepared by the National Training School to uplift the race and to obtain a livelihood. Now the emphasis of the school was the three B's, the Bible, the bath, and the broom. Burroughs created her own history course that was dedicated to informing women about society influencing Negroes in history. She also included uh, a Latin class in uh, her school. Um, since this was not a topic that was discussed in regular historical curriculum, Burroughs found it necessary to teach African American women to be proud of their race. Now she lived until 1961 and uh, three years after her death, the institution was renamed the Nanny Burrow School and has remained that way since. As a matter of fact, now it is a school, uh, an elementary school. In 1964, uh, the school that Burroughs had founded in 1909 uh, was renamed the Nanny Helen Burroughs School in her honor. And its trade hall has been designated as a National Historic Landmark. In 1975, the mayor Washington of Washington, D.C., Mayor Walter E. Washington, declared May 10th Nanny Helen Burroughs Day. So tomorrow will be Nanny Helen Burroughs Day. Her... <clears throat> School it was located or is located 
in Northeast DC and what was formerly Grant Street, but has now been renamed after her. So now the street is Nanny Helen Burroughs Avenue in Northeast DC. Now, uh, she did many, many other things. She was also a playwright. Uh, she was very active politically. Um, but I just want to share a few ideas or a few facts about her because a lot of people are unaware of Nanny Helen Burroughs. Thank you. Judy. Yes, ma'am. We are awaiting your arrival. Good morning and happy Mother's Day to all. My name is Judy Duckworth, and I'd like to share with you a prayer for mothers of grown children from my own mother's prayer book. Lord, as Mary's son, you experience the love between mother and child, a love that begins as one of total dependency and matures to a love of equals. A mother ought to feel a job satisfied and finished at that point, but it doesn't work that way, at least not for me. I continue to worry about my grown children and their lives, jobs, and families. If I could, I would probably try to protect them from all problems much as I tried when they were small. Fortunately for them and me, I have no such power. I know they must make mistakes in order to develop maturity. I know their lives will include problems. And in struggling for solutions, they will discover themselves and their values. I pray, therefore, not that you protect them from all evil, but that you give them the strength to conquer the evil they meet. I pray for myself, too. Let me learn as Mary learned that day. You, reminded, you remained behind in the temple and gently reminded her that you were about your father's business. Help me to know when to be silent and when to speak, when to help and when to refuse. Develop in me the discretion and tact I need to be a good mother for my grown children. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for this. Again, please keep your mask on and remain seated as we sing together, Lord, I want to be a Christian.
take just a moment as we come to the close of our service, just before Jane and Gail come to pray, and to say to these ladies, thank you. Um, you have all done a tremendous job. It's interesting to see how the presentations grow and contract over each of the three services. Um, for instance, Mary, you told us a lot of new information. And for that, I am thankful. Also, Marion, I don't think you are Esther. You don't look nearly at that age. Um, Esther's quite old, and she's probably gone at this point. And things. So I also want to say to, uh, to Molly that I am so thankful for you presenting Harriet Tubman. I think it's really important that we present and that we in the church see women of all different types as persons of strength who can provide leadership. So that's a wonderful tribute to her. Uh, I was telling some of the ladies that one of the things that has happened in my career is that I served in Cambridge for many years just as the Tubman resurgence was starting and there was a lot going on there. And One of my members owned the store where Harriet Tubman was hit by the weight and that's very much a true story. And she's a tribute to women and to African Americans everywhere. I, I hope that we will begin in the church to see one another as equals. As partners in the work of Christ, it was not until 1968 that women earned the right to be an ordained United Methodist pastor. Um, and that's way too late. And uh, one of the, some of the very best pastors I know are the bishops of the church who are women, my colleagues in ministry who are, are women, and I just want to make that statement that we support you, we affirm your leadership, we thank you for this service and for everything you do in the life of this church. One of the things I've done in other places, I was leaning over and telling Nancy, uh, because I can't not talk during church, it's just an occupational hazard, um, is that I often would call the men down on Mother's Day to the front, and we would sing to the ladies who remained seated a, a wonderful old hymn of the church. And on Father's Day, I would invite the ladies to come down to the front of the church, and they would sing to the men a wonderful old favorite of the church. We're not going to do that today because so often when we did that, the men grumbled. <laughs> the women never did. The men complained um, and things. So, but on this Mother's Day, um, thank you all so very, very much. I do want to say to you, I hope that you'll take the time to whatever kind of mother you had to give thanks for her. I know that Gail and Jim and I will certainly do that with our mom and, and, and things. Um, and just to know that you and I are people who care because of their influence. As I mentioned at the very beginning, we in Methodism trace our roots really back to Susanna Wesley. Were it not for her raising and caring for those 17 children. And she's worshipped with him every day as a group. And then each week she met with each one to ask them the question, how is it with your soul? Uh, we would not be here, quite frankly. So we as a, a, a whole denomination are thankful for Susanna Wesley. So Jane Bishop... And Gail Philippi, come to help us close our service at this time. Again, to all of you ladies, happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Happy Mother's Day. Uh, would you join me in the closing prayer? Dear Lord, to those who mothered colleagues, mentees, neighborhood kings, kids, to those remembering mothers no longer with us, to those moving forward from moms who did not show love or hurt they, those they should have cared for. Today is a day to honor the unyielding love and care for the others we call motherhood. Wherever we have found it and in whatever ways we have found to cultivate it within ourselves, Lord, we ask that you continue to guide our journeys. Amen.
please join me in prayer. Again and again, God welcomes us home as a mother welcomes her children. Again and again, God celebrates us, God's children, and delights in watching and helping us grow. Come now into the warmth of love. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. You are loved, precious child of your mothering God. Amen. In just a moment, Vic will begin the postlude. In case that you are a guest here, let me help you know uh, so you feel a little more comfortable in how we exit the building. We ask that the person seated in the back follow the guidance of two very handsome ushers, Terry on this side and Bennett on this side. Yes, they did pay me to say that. Um, and, and we'll ask those in the back to exit first. The offering box is over here by the exit door, uh, just if you would like to give. Let me take one second and say thank you for your generous giving. Uh, you guys have been so faithful to this church. We have not missed a beat because of God's faithfulness and your faithfulness. So thank you for that. And um, then as we move towards the front, uh, we'll exit and follow out. Have a wonderful, wonderful Mother's Day. God bless you. Thank you for coming. And, Car and John has carnations for the mothers that he's passing out. You're going to be in the front. Oh, you're not passing them out. You were doing it last time, as far as I was concerned. So there's carnation, a pink carnation for every lady as you exit the door. Please take available your veil of those. Thank you for being here. Dick.